This is a wonderful dividend for having been chosen the honored guest last year, Clyde. Okay. Colonel Bunker, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, address Mrs. McKinney, but really, aren't we all members of the McKinney family? <laughs> And what a wonderful thing it is to be together. And tonight, as a dividend for having received, having been in this position last year, it's my privilege to introduce to you this year the American Man of the Year. Our honored uh, guest tonight is a man of many talents and great American service. Your program, which uh, Mr. Sullivan has printed for you, has an account of his life and his activities, and I certainly recommend it to you for your careful reading. Our honored guest tonight was born in Oklahoma. He's crowded a great deal in the last 60-odd years, and he's still at it. While his parents were part a Cherokee Indian and were raised on an Indian reservation, his father was a successful lawyer and his mother a successful teacher. And she saw to it that her son, Clyde, was well-educated. He finished high school at the age of uh, 16 then he went to the New Mexico Military Institute. While there, he was on the honor roll. Then he finished the last two years at the University of Oklahoma, then three years in law school, graduated in 1931 as a class marshal, which I understand is the designation for an outstanding senior man. Also at graduation, he was the cadet corporal for the ROTC. Colonel. Colonel. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> cadet colonel. Gee whiz, I demoted you in a hurry. <laughs> and then he started law practice with a partner, Mr. M.A. Looney, who has been a lifetime friend of his. In 1938, he formed another more important partnership with June Marion Alley, who became Mrs. Watts. And I think you'd be interested this evening in meeting Mrs. Watts, won't you please take a bow? <laughs> now, in addition to Mrs. Watts, we have the other members of his family, and I'd like to have you meet Marion Watts Arnold. whose husband has served in the uh, Pacific as a medical doctor. He was, he's been in the service there for two years. And then there is Charles Watts, who served his country as infantry officer, spending a year in the Cambodian front. And his wife, Janet. Charles was awarded the Bronze Star. Brian could not be here. He's uh, just finished his uh, uh, junior, his sophomore year at college, and he's now on duty with the Naval Reserve. We miss him. But Gary is here. Gary, who attends, is attending the <laughs> New Mexico... New 
Mexico Military Institute and uh, doing a great job uh, down there. Now, while he was establishing his uh, law practice and developing a real reputation, as a, especially as a trial attorney, Pearl Harbor hit us. And in January of 1942, Mr. Watts entered uh, military duty as a captain in the artillery. He served in, uh, in India, in Burma, in China, and finally spearheaded the march to reopen the Burma Road from the Chinese side. He spent a great deal of time in China, made some very close friendships. He showed me a picture this evening of a young man who is the son of a very good Chinese general friend of his. And, uh, and this uh, young man is now in Mr. Watts' home. While in the service, he received uh, recognition in the form of uh, uh, formal medals. He was awarded the Air Medal, the Bronze Star, the Cloud Banner of Ordway, the Chinese uh, Combat Command Commendation, the Chinese Yun Y Medal, the Asiatic Pacific Ribbon with two campaign stars. In 1945, he was made a full colonel as he returned to the United States and was released in October of 1945. He did, however, uh, take command of the, of, uh, the uh, 14th uh, Artillery uh, in, uh, in the Reserve and uh, quickly advanced to be one of the outstanding units in this uh, division uh, in the country. In 1955, he was promoted to Brigadier General of the Army of the United States. In 1969, and I skip over these years rather quickly, he turned down a second star to retire from the reserve and devote full time to the law practice and his important role as an American patriotic leader. It was while he was in China that he was upset by the sellout of our allies and he began his crusade for, uh, for patriotism and for the, the defense of his uh, country and, and, and freedom. He also served, as you know, as the attorney for General Walker in his uh, rather important and significant, shall I just call it a, quarrel with the United States government and with the news media and made a great record in that case, although, well, you guess who turned it down, our United States Supreme Court. Now, General Watts flies around the country campaigning, if you please, for America. He flies his own plane, travels from coast to coast, and it's surprising how many engagements he's able to keep in that way. I can't help but recall for you an incident that we experienced in Wisconsin. My daughter Janet had engaged him to talk to the Republican women in the state of Wisconsin at Fond du Lac, and that's about 60 miles from Milwaukee. And of course, uh, General Watts was flying in with his plane. And uh, the girls had to meet him someplace. And so he advised them that he would phone in before landing so they'd know where to meet him, which airport and about what time. Now, you should know that his call numbers on his uh, radio telephone on his plane, 7798 Romeo. Now, don't ask me how you arrive at these call letters and so forth, but... Anyway, his call name is Romeo. 
Well, my daughter Janet had to go up to Fond du Lac before she received this telephone call and had to take some chance on catching him when he was up there. And her husband was at home. And he received a telephone call, long distance calling, uh, collect, Romeo. <laughs> and he wasn't about to pay any collect telephone call for his <laughs> wife from Romeo. <laughs> Needless to say, he landed at the airport and my other daughter, I think, was the one that met him. He made the, he made the appointment and did very well for the girl. He now, as I've indicated, heads his own law firm of Watts, Looney, Nichols, and Johnson. He's a member of the John Birch Society and has been on the council for three years. Our Speaker's Bureau uses him, and he belongs to many other organizations, uh, some of which are enumerated in the program. He, he is, uh, he spends almost his entire time working on this very uh, uh, important mission of, uh, in, the, in that he feels a great sense of loyalty to our country and is concerned about the preservation of our freedom. He's, uh, uh, and I'd just like to remind you that so much criticism is leveled at the military under present circumstances, it's well to remind ourselves about the very patriotic leadership that has come out of our own military organization. We probably can start with George Washington, Robert E. Lee, General MacArthur, and now we have the American Man of the Year that I'd like to present to you this evening, General Clyde Watts. Well, I thank you. I'm glad I made my speech last night. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, <laughs> have hope. It'll be short. <laughs> the hour's late, and even though I'm inspired by the unquenchable spirit of people like this, <clears throat> I'm going to make a massive effort to stay on target and keep it short. I'm deeply <clears throat> and humbly grateful for the gathering of this fabulous group of people from the length and breadth of the United States to express a sincere and abiding determination that the sacrifices of the great man who have, preceded, who have preceded us will not have been made in vain. I say again, I am deeply and humbly grateful. One of my legal brethren one time introduced me and said, here is one of the most modest men I have known in a long time. But of course, he has lots to be modest about. I've had a rather, as Bill suggested, a rather hectic career as a soldier, a lawyer, a polo player. We used to run on a track team, and it's come in awful handy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyers have always said, well, there's a good soldier. The soldiers have always said, there's a good lawyer. One time I was down at Fort Sill dressing a military group. This grizzled old colonel got up, said, oh, now, this next speaker reminds me of an incident 
that happened off the coast of California in a boat. <clears throat> Three citizens were fishing. They looked down, a geyser of water was coming up from the bottom of the boat. They looked to the shore, a school of sharks. Someone had to go for help. They didn't want to stay there and be inert shark meat. Of course, there was no way the Padre could go. No way. Too many people were absolutely <laughs> Father Fenton dependent completely on his on for their spiritual welfare, on his survival. The engineer, of course, whipped out his slide rule, figured they had 18 and a half minutes to remain afloat. He concluded, of course, that in the middle of Los Angeles, he had a huge building and a very delicate state of uncompletion. That swarm in school of sharks out there had nothing to do with his decision, but he just couldn't go. Of course, there's nothing the lawyer could say. He dove in, started swimming, got to the sharks, another geyser of water went up. The padre and the engineer crossed their, covered their eyes, looked again. Behold, these sharks had formed a perfect V and were escorting this lawyer to shore. <laughs> <laughs> the padre again crossed himself deliberately and reverently. Look to the engineer, behold, my friend, we have seen a miracle. Typical of the engineer, on the contrary, Father, that is nothing in the world but professional courtesy. <laughs> so, as a part-time soldier and a part-time lawyer, you see the travails that I've had to suffer. Bill mentioned poor old Tad Walker, my old classmate. My heart feels like a ton of lead every time I think of Tad. We tried a lawsuit in Fort Worth, Texas. The Associated Press had issued a news report around the world that General Walker arrived on the campus of the University of Mississippi, assumed command of a mob, and led a charge against U.S. Marshal. An absolute fabricated, filthy lie. We tried the case, the first one, in Fort Worth. To court came, Betty Coles knows all about it. I believe you were there, weren't you, Betty? Betty was there. Were you there, Medford? Medford was there. To court came not one employee of the Associated Press to prove the truth of the fair, fabulous <coughs> misstatement they had made about Ted. At the end of that lawsuit, the jury went out, deliberated, and brought back a verdict of $800,000. About six months later, we tried our second case in Shreveport. To court came everybody, Paul Miller, the executive, the president of Associated Press, Alan Gould, the executive editor, Relman Moran, the chief news host, Ken Davis, the chief of the New Orleans News Bureau, where the filthy lie was fabricated, a lad, Van H. Savelle, who was listed as the, as the government's complaining witness, came to tell his story. By the time we got through dragging that group over the courtroom by the nose and by various other parts of their anatomy, it was so obviously a fabricated falsehood that the jury went out and brought back a verdict of $3 million as an expression of their disapproval of image-making in the press. I told them during the argument that Ted Walker was a victim of organized editorial policy and image-making, wherein the enemy were good guys, the anti-communists were bad guys, Ted was a criminal and a lunatic, and the jury produced the type of a verdict that was deserved. The Supreme Court of Mississippi affirmed the case. The Supreme Court of Texas affirmed their case. It appeared before Mr. Chief Justice Warren. The uh, attorney for the Associated Press was one William Rogers, who is now a very high office holder in the United States of America. He read his argument, believe it or not. I was tempted to ask who had read it. During the course of the argument, he said to the court, and if it please the court, the noggingly persistent question in this case is, 
What was Walker of Texas doing in Mississippi? I submit the answer in his own words. Quote, bring your tent flag and skillet. Stand beside your courageous governor in his confrontation with the Antichrist Supreme Court, <laughs> who in their denial of prayer and betrayal of a nation have plunged our country into dire peril. <laughs> he sat down. I got up. <laughs> this is a rose, but it's a pale flower compared to the color of Mr. Chief Justice Warren's face. He glared at me, Mr. Watts. You stated that your client took no part in the violence of this mob. You know, you're supposed to address them as Mr. Chief Justice, or Mr. Justice, uh, Mr. Chief Justice Warren, or Mr. Justice Black. I could see what was going to happen, so something came over me. It may have been a little touch of... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I refuse to identify it even, but anyhow, some kind of a touch came over. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And three juries, including a federal grand jury, have so held. Well, what do you say about this, sir? <laughs> he started reading the record. How tear gas was fired, automobiles overturned, fires were burning, curses, screams, epithets, rocks flowing. Never, and rocks were being thrown. Never did say that Ted Walker was leading it, as the Associated Press and Van Savell had charged. He finally laid it down triumphantly and said, now, Mr. Watts, what do you say about that, sir? I say, sir, that the court had just finished reading from the record an unsworn statement of a witness with which he was confronted on cross-examination. He denied it under oath. The jury didn't believe a word of it as evidenced by their $3 million verdict. <laughs> it was so ridiculous, Wizard White held his hand up in front of his mouth and laughed. Now, that's the travail under which poor Ted Walker is suffering tonight. About four months later, an opinion came out. Nothing in this record indicates a severe departure from accepted publishing standards. What did I have in the record? Three specific findings. <clears throat> the report was false, was not fair comment, was not published in good faith as the honest opinion of the writer. Now, when the Supreme Court is dealing with a conservative, that is what happens when the law goes on the books as to what is acceptable publishing standards in the press of the United States of America, upon whom we are as dependent for our information as an infant child on the breast of his mother. God help that child if that milk would be so adulterated as is the news that we read in this news meeting. <laughs> Tragically, the most corrosive pollution problem that America faces today is in the consolidated news media of the United States. So now we sit here this evening, inspired as I'm sure all of you are, being almost within echo range of the shot heard round the world, of the challenging words that the redcoats are coming. What would those brave men think tonight <clears throat> had they had to suffer the travail of hearing the reading of the article that I read to you yesterday evening, entitled to the collapse of our armed forces? What would Paul Revere have thought after challenging his fellow Americans that the redcoats are coming to see young Americans say better red than dead. What would those honorable and honest people think if the news media had the guts enough to dig out some really pertinent papers and go into that State Department and demand the record of the American betrayal of China? John Patton Davies, John Carter Vincent, John Stewart Service, dominated by Owen Lattimore. What would those patriots think of the record of Dean Rusk, who was over in China when it happened? What would they think were the reports of General Wedemeyer, whom I have listened to repeatedly hour after hour after tear-jerking hour? What would they think, those patriots, if those reports were made of record by an eager press, 
Now, these people want to do something at the right place at the right time. Let's fly above these silly Pentagon papers, which are aftermath. Let's find out what caused the Korean War. Let's find out what caused the Vietnamese War. You'll find that the most ruthless, <laughs> vicious, heartless betrayal of all history occurred in 1943, 1944, 1945, when the American State Department was planning the delivery to the communist enemy of the balance of power of the Orient. Let's suppose our president, when he wrote, I have a hunch, Stalin wants nothing but security for his country, and if I give him everything I can, asking nothing in return, he will not endeavor to annex anything and will work for a democratic, peaceful world. Suppose he had received a blood transfusion from some simple patron. And by the time his plane landed in Tehran, he had said, now, Uncle Joe, I have just been in ESP contact with my high school history teacher. She tells me that uh, some of your predecessors said, we'll first dominate Eastern Europe. Now, you're asking me to give you Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Eastern Poland, or, or Poland, Eastern Germany, Czechoslovakia, Udo, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Romania. Isn't that Eastern Europe, Uncle Joe? And you're also demanding that I disarm the Japanese and give to your ruthless forces in Manchuria all of the armament that I take away from the Japanese, plus supporting Mao Zedong and his evil brood, whom some of my people are working right now on to liquidate. Now, if I do that, may you not someday come to Cuba? Because I, I read here my high, where my high school history teacher has been in ESP contact with me, and I have written down what she's been trying so desperately to tell me. I read that, you, that your predecessors have said that after we have dominated Eastern Europe and the masses of Asia, we will then encircle the United States. Uncle Joe, don't you really intend to come to Cuba? Well, may you not someday show up out here at Cal Berkeley and, and set up a training, a staging area for the training of our college students to be better read than dead? And who? Canada. Oh, I got the colic. Just trying to get in there. As much as I'd love to not forget Canada, I'm just going to deliberately forget it because it's getting late. And if I'd ever get into Canada, we'd be here the rest of the evening. But I do want to challenge you, my friends, to read and reread. Borrow from some of your military friends the Armed Forces Journal and find out the fantastic course of events behind the collapse of our armed forces. And ask yourself who is going to defend from foreign soldiers marching up and down in our streets these helpless women when the time comes, and it could certainly arrive before our great country reaches its 200th birthday. So the time has arisen, my friends, and is overdue for America to wake up, to rechallenge itself with the glories of the past, and extend into the future the God-given faith, hope, concepts of duty, honor, country that can save us from the debacle that we probably so richly deserve, that may some way belie the old high school truism that the most significant fact of history is man's absolute refusal to learn from history. Let's learn a little bit. Let's realize that we are facing the foulest and most soul-destroying tyranny that has ever darkened and stained the pages of history. Let's recapture while we can the determination, the faith, the dedication, the devotion to recognize this problem and meet it like Americans, like the heroes that have gone before and have probably trod this very ground, would hope and pray that we would retain the capability of walking in their footsteps. Thank you.